Okay, well, so it starts. Um, are there questions about the writing assignments? I didn't really go over it in class, did I? Um, are there any questions about it? No? Okay. I think it's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's not straightforward, but <laughs> that is the questions aren't straightforward, but what you're supposed to do is straightforward. <laughs> uh, um, all right, so I'm just going to start talking about the point of These are his dates. So he's he's the oldest of the pe four people we're going to read next, but not that much older. They pretty much were all around the same time. Um, uh, however, I I feel like somehow his way of thinking comes first before the other people we're going to read next. So. Um, uh, and that's true, even though the particular book this reading is from, Philosophy of Loyalty, was published in 1908. So um, it was actually published after the next couple of things were um, um, Presumably, you know, I haven't read that much by him, so I, I don't know if he said the same thing. 20 years earlier, probably not, but I'm sure he had some of the ideas earlier anyway. Oh, let's see. So he was born in Grass Valley, California, which is in the foothills of the Sierras. It's kind of like between Sacramento and Tahoe. I've actually been there and they have a public library named after Josiah Royce. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, his parents came to California in the gold rush. Um, and his mother, Sarah Eleanor Royce, actually published a memoir of her experience. I haven't read that, but maybe it's worth reading. But anyway, um, and then he graduated in one of the first graduating classes at the University of California in 1874. So that was one reason like, I knew I had to get him into this class. <laughs> um, he's, you know, by the way, actually, I think I mentioned that the philosophy building at Harvard is called Emerson Hall, but the philosophy building at UC Berkeley is called Royce Hall, it's named after Royce, even though Royce, after he graduated the University of California, he went on to get his PhD from, I think, Johns Hopkins. Yeah, Johns Hopkins, and then he spent most of his life teaching at Harvard. Um, but still, we can claim him as our philosopher. So, um, and to a certain extent, I think he's associated with the with the American pragmatist school that I mentioned in the first lecture, right? The James and Dewey, um, but uh, um, to say the least, there's a lot of German idealism mixed in. Doesn't that sound that much like James? Um, okay. Um, that's all that I wanted to say about uh, voice in general. Other questions? If so, I probably don't know the answer, but I always say that. All right. Um, so in this book, I mean, clearly we're dealing again somehow with the issue of um, individuality, particularity, and universality. Um, now, it won't be so clear until next time, maybe it won't be that clear then either, but anyway, it won't be clear until next time uh, how Royce relates this to America in particular. Um, but there is actually a hint. Um, so this is on page 52 that he's thinking about America from the beginning when he says this, because um, he 
he describes the kind of cause um, to which one may be loyal as an union of many in one. Right, and union of many in one is out of many one. Is, um, one of the slogans of the whatever uh, mottos of the United States. Um, and uh, and it's an especially loaded phrase after the Civil War, obviously. Um, so uh, although Royce um, to begin with, doesn't spend a lot of time discussing loyalty to America. I think he's he's got that in mind from you know from the beginning. Um, it also raises this phrase a union of men or at the end union. Um, I'm no, sorry, I'm just wondering. I'm always, I always wonder how you're really supposed to pronounce that when they, when they say like and union or union. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so uh, a union of many in one. So I think this also raises uh, the question of whether this union is what Jonathan Edwards would call a cordial union, right? A union of hearts. Um, now, I mean, I don't think Royce is actually alluding to Edwards. I think it's unlikely he's alluding to Edwards, but I guess not impossible. Um, um, but still, I mean, um, that's the question. That, that a phrase like this raises, like, how is this union of many in one going to be accomplished? How are these different wills going to be aligned with each other? Um, is it going to be by a principle? Um, So, okay, so that's what we're talking about. And I think like, as usual, we start with a question about individuals. So the question about individuals is, um, you know, how is the individual will to be determined? That's the question Edward starts with also, right? How, like, um, I mean, um, this is the question that Emerson and Thoreau start with. I mean, so like, I guess another thing I should say about Josiah Royce is, although he's definitely an interesting philosopher and worth reading, he's, I think it's like, um, he's not in the same class as Emerson and Thoreau. <laughs> he's, um, so it's like, this is a little bit of a drop down to a lower level or something. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I mean, that is sort of the question that Emerson and Thoreau are also asking. How is the individual will to be determined? How am I to settle on uh, a course? So like when we ask that question in the abstract, how is the individual will to be determined? I mean, I think in asking how is it to be, I'm kind of uh, leaving ambiguous uh, or maybe refusing this, this classification as of yet at least, whether we're asking, you know, how is it possible for it to be determined at all? 
or asking how should it be determined? Um, I think uh, Royce is definitely asking both of those questions together. Right. So anyway, so the question is, how is the individual will to be determined? And the um, we're asking about the individual in the abstract. Um, so this question demands a universal answer. Right. We're asking for universal principles by which an individual will can or perhaps should be determined. And Royce's answer is um, by a particularity. The universal, the individual needs particularity to do this. Right? So the like um the um the universal question which um the answer to the universal question it's a universal answer but it but it but its answer is that the individual can't do this merely based on universal principles they need something particular um and in particular, you know, what they need is what Royce calls loyalty to a cause, where a cause is some particular cause. So like one example of a particular cause, although it's only one among many, but it's an example among many that Royce always gives is, um, loyalty to a nation or in Jefferson's term to a people. Um, so Royce has a principled argument for why the freedom of individuals um, that is, you know, what's declared when we say that all men are created equal, et cetera, et cetera that freedom of individuals can be asserted only on the condition of um, the freedom of, among other things, peoples, right? That is, um, so the reason um, we say like um, that at this point in the course of human events, a certain people has to separate from another and then justify that by saying all these things about individual freedom is that, or at least part of the answer is, the beginning of the answer is, well, because individual freedom um, um, is freedom to particular causes. And so individual freedom demands like freedom for its cause. Um, or I guess, you know, you could say like um, individuals can can separate from a union only in order to form a more perfect union. They can't separate just to be individuals. So, okay, so I mean, so that's Royce's uh, you know, that's Royce's position in a nutshell. And the question is, why does, why does he think the individual needs this? Um, and um, it's important to understand what kind of need we're talking about here. So um, Royce calls it, this is on page 59, um, The very deepest of his, his here is, well, it's a man, right? So it's a man and it's him. Um, uh, again, we would, we would like him to say a person, <laughs> a human being, an individual. Um, and, um, but the point is, 
whoever we're talking about here, this uh, loyalty to a particular cause is the very deepest of their moral needs. Um, what does that mean? Well, so, um, I think what Royce means by a moral need is that, uh, I mean, it's basically what I was just talking about. A moral need is something you need in order to want anything at all. Um, right, so it's, or at least that's true of the deepest moral need anyway, right? So it's like, that's how it's different from the ordinary needs, right? Like I need, you know, food and water and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, what do I need them for? Well, you know, I need them to stay alive. Okay, why do I need to stay alive? Well, so, uh, right, that's, that's, that's a, uh, what's that? I said it's probably the alternative, it's a debatable. It's debatable, right. Well, that's like, uh, I forget which dialogue this is in, where Socrates says, like, gives the example of a sea captain who knows how to get his passengers safely to land, but who doesn't know whether it's better for them to live or to die, <laughs> right? So, um, so he uh, um, he doesn't know whether he's doing them a favor or not when he gets them safely to land, basically, right? So, um, um, so it's not like so much a question of like what. Um, do I want as like as it's an answer to the question how can I want? Where where can I even start with one example? Um, so I mean I I think that's what Royce means. Now like he's he's not always that clear about that. He makes it sound like um You know, so like, here's what he says at the very beginning on page 51. By the way, why is the very beginning page 51? So this is lecture two. I guess this these were, these were originally lectures. Uh, this is lecture two. I didn't assign lecture one, mostly because lecture two contains a long summary of lecture one at the beginning. <laughs> so uh, I thought, uh, given that, you know, as usual, my problem was how to find room for everything in this course. I was like, well, I'm gonna take advantage of that and just assign lecture two, <laughs> right? So, because it actually, if you read lecture one and then read the beginning of lecture two, it's somewhat repetitive, <laughs> right? So, um, so anyway, what he says at the beginning, at the very beginning of, on page 51 is, um, for our own individual good, we all need loyalty and need to find causes to which we can be loyal. Right, and that sounds kind of like, you know, for our own individual good, we all need food and shelter and whatever, right? But um, um, but I think what he really means is that we need that in order for there to be anything that's good for us at all, right? So it's not like one good among the other things that we need. Um, and as I said, I'm, I mean, I'm kind of putting those words into Royce's mouth, but I don't think what he's saying makes sense unless you understand it that way. Um, so therefore, like to say that our deepest moral need is loyalty is not like, in, it's not in competition with statements like the good of the individual is pleasure um, or power or whatever. Um, Those things like pleasure and power are only going to um, work if they can somehow uh, um, in themselves get us to determine our will, to decide what to do. 
And Roy spends a lot of time in chapter one and then repeats it more briefly here in chapter two, trying to explain why that's impossible. So like, why is that impossible? I mean, it seems like, yeah, that's, that's perfectly possible. Decide what to do based on what's most pleasant to you. Isn't that what we mostly do? So his claim is that we don't and can't do that because as he puts it, and this is on page 57, um, it's like basically that we even, we logically can't do that. Why not? The natural man more or less vaguely and unconsciously asks such questions as what he just said above that, you know, for what do I live, for what am I good, etc. But if he looks merely within his natural self, he cannot answer them. Within himself, he finds vague cravings for happiness, a chaos of desires, a medley of conflicting instincts. Right, so the, the, the point is that these things like pleasure and power are not going to be sufficient to determine our will because um, um, when we look inside ourselves, we just find a chaos of conflicting desires, which can't all be satisfied at the same time. Um, and um, uh, no principle for deciding how to reconcile them with each other. So, I mean, you know, there's various things that are pleasurable in different ways. There's various kinds of power that are, you know, that you can get in different ways and they're not consistent with each other. You have to give up some of them to get the other one and vice versa. And Royce is saying that like within what he's calling the natural man, that is, um, I think, so, you know, the natural man, so you shouldn't, well, you should and you shouldn't. You shouldn't think of this as like cavemen. <laughs> Right, um, but I mean, you you can think of it as like human beings before society existed. But then you're going to be thinking of human beings before society existed, like the way Rousseau thinks of them. You know, so like as individuals who are just kind of like wandering around, <laughs> um, uh, and. Yeah, at any given time, you may have a kind of impulse to do something, but those don't all add up to any kind of plan. Um, so, um, so they don't really give an answer to this question. So, I mean, whether that's right or not, I don't know, but it's uh, not ridiculous anyway. Um, Right, or here's another way he puts it on page 81. I'll just read it from my notes. Happiness involves the satisfaction of desires. Your natural desires are countless and conflicting. What satisfies one de desire defeats another. Until your desires are harmonized by means of some definite plan of life, happiness is therefore a mere accident. I think what he means by saying happiness is a mere accident is that like, um, I guess, uh, if it so happens that you end up with a lot of your desires fulfilled, that won't be, could be because of some plan you made. Because um, you don't like you don't have a, a rule by which to make a plan. Is there some sound coming from a Zoom or something? Um, so, I mean, so our own like individual desires and, and impulses and whatever don't answer this question. Now, so, I mean, but in society, of course, we don't just wander around. We do act as if we have a plan. Um, um, but we do that under the control of society, or what Royce calls the social order, right? So, um, right, the social order defines certain types of people, like classes, professions, um, 
um, offices that can be occupied and what people actually do just falls into those available slots, right? So at some time, you know, and why? Uh, um, a lot of times it's something pretty slight <laughs> that makes that decision, <laughs> right? When you, you know, when it comes down to it, you decide what you're going to major in or what you're going to, you know, what job you're going to apply to or whatever, right? So it's, um, that is, um, for, for that to happen doesn't require that you have a plan that you're using. Um, and society makes it easy to do it. And like, so once you fall into those slots, one of those slots that society has prescribed, then, then it's clear um, how your will is going to be determined, <laughs> right? Um, however, um, well, Royce has two complaints about this. Um, one is, he says, it gives us no, these are both on page 58. So. I don't know why I feel, maybe it's kind of superstitious. I feel like it's important to read it from the text rather than from the text, like even though I just copied the text into my notes. I don't know. Well, all right, anyway, <laughs> it gives us no one overmastering ideal. Um, I think that's, well, maybe it's not supposed to be separate from the next, from the other complaint, which is the next sentence. It controls him, but often by the very show of authority, it also inflames his self-will, right? So you find yourself in one of these slots, um, and now society tells you what to do, but society doesn't give you, like, a reason why that's a good thing to do. I mean, that's just not on offer, right? Um, so, uh, um, so you keep doing it, but you're not happy about it, what Royce says, right? Like you feel like um, you want to exert your own individual will and make your own choice and not just go along this slot that has been prescribed for you. Um, but as Roy said before, if you try to do that just by saying, okay, I'm gonna decide for myself based on my own desires and whatever, you find that that's not, that doesn't work any better. Um, so Royce concludes that the will of the individual can only be determined um, that is, the individual can only have a self that wants some particular thing if they freely choose to dedicate themselves to something that's greater than themselves. And that's what he means by loyalty. Right? So that's the definition of loyalty, the willing and practical and thoroughgoing devotion of a person to a cause. Um, and, you know, so in order to do this, the cause must be, um, well, a couple of points. First of all, it must be actually, it must be among the causes that are provided by the social order. You can't just invent it. It has to actually be there. Meaning, what does it mean for it to be there? There have to be other people involved in this cause. Um, and, uh, right, I think he's explicit about that in the reading for next time. This is on page 120. A cause must indeed be set before me by my social order as a possible, a practically significant, a living cause which binds many selves in the unity of one life. But the social order can't choose me, choose it for me, right? So the social order has to provide this. Um, in this, no, provide is the right word for it, you know, 
Well, that I think that is the word that you used, right? Oh, set before me, you sound like the line. I don't know. But so, I mean, I mean, but you know, the social order is. Maybe it's worth emphasizing this because what I think we're going to be seeing uh, like several authors using this phrase. I guess it was popular in the early 20th century. Um, this, you know, this the the social order isn't really a person who does it. That's you know that's the whole problem. That's why it can't give you a reason for things. You know. Um, so when I say if the social order has to provide it, it means just like it has to be found in it, <laughs> it has to be present in it. But it's not being provided for you. <laughs> um, you have to make it yours. That's the that's the basic act here. Um, So Royce said, you know, therefore it has to be, it has to be something. Well, maybe I should read those words rather than saying it. By a cause that is adapted to call forth loyalty, I mean, for the first, something which seems to the loyal person to be larger than his private self, and so to be, in some respect, external to his purely individual will. This cause must, in the second place, unite him with other persons by some social tie. So there are two different conditions. First of all, it has to be something that's that I look on as larger than my own individual will, um, because the because the purpose of it is going to be for me to to bring order to my individual will, which it intrinsically lacks. Right, so I need an external standard, and then second of all, it has to be um, it has to unite me with other people. Um, that part's harder to understand, and yet it obviously is the most, in some sense, the most important part. Right, so he's not saying, so loyalty is, as Royce understands it, is not just loyalty to some abstraction. Right, it's not like, except for his key thing about loyalty to loyalty, it's not like loyalty to an abstraction, but it's, but loyalty is not loyalty to an abstraction, you know, like that is, it's not dedicating myself to truth or something like that. It's loyalty to some cause that actually involves particular other people. Um, so he doesn't say here, and, and he doesn't say, I don't think very satisfactorily in the first lecture either, um, exactly why that's necessary, but I think it has to do with, um, and this is, I think this is something that he may be getting from Hegel here or from his understanding of Hegel. Um, it's that externality, um, um, if I dedicate the, some, myself to my own principle, then um, the externality is kind of ends up being empty. Right? Like, um, I, you know, I think, I mean, as Hegel would say, like I mean to dedicate myself to um, some principle that's, that's more universal than my will. But um, um, but in fact, I'm not able to give that any more content than the, than just the content of my will in the in the abstract because it's like it's whatever I want it to be. Basically. 
that principle is what I want it to be. If I, you know, um, I can't get it wrong. So that's why we need, for true externality, we need concrete externality. We need, I, I need something that, uh, um, comes against my will. Um, so, uh, and yet, of course, the thing that comes, you know, so the external world comes against my will, right? Like that's one of the things that Descartes and everyone else says about the difference between my, you know, my uh, external, impressions or sensations and my own thoughts that you know like i can't if i if i'm standing with open eyes and the sun is in front of me i can't not see it <laughs> it's not up to me right but of course that kind of externality in itself isn't going to help with with this right like, because that's you know i mean that's just going to do stuff to me that i have to react to but it's not gonna, like, it doesn't give me any kind of command. Um, so that's why, like, and again, this is all stuff that I don't think Roy says very clearly, but I think this is behind what he's saying. I'm trying to explain why he says that the cause I dedicate to myself has to be one that unites me to other people, right? That is this, you know, other people are like, um, are like, I can, a condition of possibility of my own will. I can sort of speak like deduce that there must be other people. I mean, I don't know if, if Royce himself would go that far. Hegel definitely does go that far, <laughs> right? Like you can kind of, uh, it's like a necessary consequence of uh, like of the nature of thought and will, that there isn't just one person, but there are many people. Um, so, um, um, many people related to me in different ways, right? Because if they were all related to me the exact same way, they would all be just the same thing, basically. <laughs> right? So we, um, so, so, you know, that's why the cause I dedicate to myself to, it can be, it can be something very small. Royce emphasizes. It can be, you know, the servant's dedication to their master, something like that. Um, obviously, that particular example is troubling, right? But it, but it is an example, according to Royce, I think, uh, of loyalty. Um, or it can be big. It can be my my nation or whatever, right? Um, um, but it has to involve someone other than myself. Now, um, now after talking about Royce and Hegel, maybe this was the wrong order, actually. Not just the wrong historical order, but maybe it's the wrong conceptual order. But, but, um, uh, but now after talking about Royce and Hegel, I'm going to talk about Royce and Kant, <laughs> right? So, um, because this this point about um, the point that happiness is not sufficient to determine the will. Because happiness is a sum, is it is like an ideal sum of, of like the fulfillment of all our desires or inclinations, and yet we don't know how to do that. Um, that's um, that's exactly what Kant says about happiness. Um, right, and I think Royce is following Kant's definition of happiness. I mean, so like, for, this is not like Aristotle's definition of happiness, although Kant sometimes seems to think it's Aristotle's definition of happiness, but it's not, 
right? We're defining happiness as kind of like the maximum satisfaction of all your desires. But again, like we don't know how to how to how to find that. Kant calls it an ideal of the imagination, which well, whatever. I won't try to explain that, but <laughs> it's I mean an an, an, an idea. Maybe I will try to explain it. <laughs> an ideal is um, um, a regular ideal, according to Kant, is. Like uh, um, a concept that claims to uh, um, define a single super sensible individual, right? So, like the um the uh the example in the critique of pure reason of the is the transcendental ideal of god right so like we have this concept that claims to um to, like to apply to exactly one object that we can know exists um so it's like so to speak by you know we can define this one thing without any reference to our senses. But an ideal of the imagination is like the, the thought that somehow our senses or imagination all put together define this one thing. And this one thing is this state of maximum fulfillment of our desire. All right, maybe I shouldn't have tried to explain that. In any case, um, so, uh, um, so he's following Kant's critique of, or uh, like um, proof that happiness in itself isn't sufficient to determine the will. But he's also rejecting what Kant offers, offers as an alter alternative, right? So that, you know, If I ask, start asking all those questions, you know, why should I eat and drink? Well, because you want to stay alive. Why should I stay alive, right? So like I'm going through a series of what Kant calls hypothetical imperatives. At every step, I'm told what to do if I want X, but I'm not told to actually do it because I'm not told to want X. Um, now, uh, um, so like one resolution to that would be, but again, Kant and Royce are agreeing that this resolution won't work, is, well, there's one thing I definitely want by definition, which is happiness, right? So, um, so just uh, like anchor that chain of hypothetical imperatives in happiness. Um, so if the question is whether I should live or die, then the answer will be, well, what will, make, what will bring you greater happiness? Um, uh, so, uh, but again, Kant and Royce were saying that this won't work. So wait, so how can I possibly decide what to do? And Kant's famous answer is that there's a kind of imperative that's not hypothetical, that's not conditional on wanting anything. It tells you to do things no matter what you want. Right, so now it doesn't matter that my desires don't add up to a coherent goal because this is this command is like independent of my desires. I don't have to consult my desires to learn what to do. Now, I mean, it's actually it's it's not quite that simple. I mean, if you didn't desire anything, this would really be enough to get things started. But um, um, but roughly speaking, that's the solution. So, and, and as I said, Royce is rejecting it. I mean, 
Uh, like on the one hand, this is what connects him to the pragmatists. So, like one other way of understanding what pragmatism is is that um, um, Hot calls uh, the questions that can be answered by hypothetical imperatives, pragmatic questions, right? So, you know, a pragmatic question would be, you know, given that I want to stay healthy, what should I eat? <laughs> um, and the hypothetical imperative will answer. But Kant says, you know, that's not enough. We can't determine our will that way. We need a categorical imperative. And the categorical imperative, I mean, so the, the categorical imperative um, says, um, it says that your will should be determined in such a way that anyone's will would be determined that way, basically. I mean, like, that's one way of looking at it anyway. Or that is, it's, I mean, that is, you have to will that the rule you're adopting be, uh, be adopted as universal law, right? So you have to, you have to determine, you have to, so to speak, determine everyone's will. Um, I mean, you are doing that. Okay? You know, it's in what sense are you doing that? It's like in Rousseau's version of this, it is Rousseau's like terrestrial version of this, right? There's, you know, when Rousseau says that when you ask, first, first of all, so he says all legislation has to be pa passed by a vote of every member of the Commonwealth. They have to all get together. They can't have representatives because Rousseau says the will can't be represented. So the will can't be represented. So what are we doing when we're voting? And Rousseau says the question we ask every voter is not, what, how would you like this issue to be resolved? But what is the universal will? <laughs> Um, and so, therefore, if I lose, if I'm in the minority, what I'm supposed to say to myself is not, unfortunately, the other people's wills triumphed over mine, but unfortunately, it turned out I was wrong about what the universal will is. I got the wrong answer. <laughs> right. So, I mean, so similarly, in this, in the kingdom of ends, you know, you're going to be asked, like, you're going to be asked, what is the will of all rational beings on this planet? <laughs> um, all right. So, but um, but the pragmatists, as, as I, at least one way of understanding what pragmatism means or should mean is that um, there are no pure practical questions like this that require a categorical answer as the categorical imperative as the answer, there are only pragmatic questions, right? So that's like pragmatist slogan is, you know, that, that what's important is what works. <laughs> so like, so how are we gonna avoid the problem that, wait, works for what? <laughs> Right, that's that's the problem the categorical imperative is supposed to solve, or we might think happiness could solve it, but um, not sure what James how James or Dewey should be classified here, but but for sure Royce, as we've seen, thinks that no happiness can't solve it either. So, um, and so this is why I'm saying maybe I, I, I said things in the wrong order. This, you know, like um, the, the 
rejection of this or claiming that this is not enough. Right? This is like Roy saying, Roy, this is like dedicating yourself to an abstract principle. Right? So the rejection of this and saying that it's not enough is characteristic not only of pragmatism, but also of post-Kantian idealism. And that's, you know, that's one way to see how they're getting mixed together in Roy's sense. So that, you know, so anyway, um, um, right? So the, the resolution will not be this. And it will not be this, but it will be that um, it's true. The individual on their own, there's nothing they can do to determine their wealth. That's why they have to be part of a larger social group. Um, and, you know, this, so like how much, of, how clearly does Royce understand what his disagreement with Kant is. I'm not sure, and I'm not sure because of his use of the term autonomy. Um, so, um, and it's worth talking about this because, because uh, I think that there's a lot of misunderstandings about the me meaning of this word in contemporary philosophy too. So that is of what it, what Kant means by it, because everyone knows that this is Kant's term. Um, and it comes up in um, Royce's response to one of his four individualist opponents. So, right, there's these four people that objected to, Roy, to when Royce told them his theory of loyalty, they, they objected on grounds of individualism. Um, I guess uh, one of them doesn't really have a, a specific representative. No, I guess the last two don't really have a specific representative in the end. But the first two have individual people who pose them to, right? And this is the educator, right? So the educator, um says um what these youth need right so that, that you know this educator is like in charge of a teacher who has charge of many youths so it's probably like a university I don't know but anyway so uh in a distant community, maybe St. Louis actually. But in any case, this is what the educator says. What these youth need is the sense that each individual has his own personal duty and should develop his own conscience and should not look to loyalty to excuse him from individual responsibility. Right, so the objection is that um, when people act out of loyalty, they'll be like, um, um, well, so, I mean, this comes up on college campuses. It also comes up with the police, right? Where, you know, where you say, like, um, um, where when you try to hold one of them accountable, for something, they all they close ranks, right? So um, that's the educator is afraid of the youths, um, like forming little clubs and gangs and whatever, and like uh, rather than being personally accountable, they'll excuse their actions by saying that they're being loyal to their club, right? Just like the the police might say, well, we have to be loyal to our own first or something like that. So um, the police isn't his example, that's my example, but right. So, um, so Royce translates this on the next page. So that was page 63 and this is page 64. Um, in other words, Loyalty seems to be opposed to the development of that individual autonomy of the moral will, which, 
as I told you in the last lecture, Kant insists upon. Right, so he's explicitly saying that he's talking about autonomy in Kant's sense. And like on this understanding of autonomy, um, autonomy, act, acting autonomously is basically like acting according to my own purposes and not letting someone else tell me what to do. That's so the educator is saying, uh, you know, um, that like, we have to encourage the youth to like each take responsibility for their own decisions and like um, not uh, try to like um, shift responsibility onto some group that they're loyal to. Um, Or is, uh, you know, and therefore uh, he speaks when he talks about the legislator, the uh, legislator, educator, he talks about the educator's own, quote, autonomous choice of his career, right? Like this is, you know, so I mean, that's part of his coming back against the, the educator saying that, well, like, you know, no, you understand how autonomy can go together with loyalty. You chose your own career as educator autonomously. Um, and yet that career involves loyalty to the youth on your charge, for example, right? So, um, um, or as he explains that a little bit later, this is on page 78, um, bottom of page 78. So far as moral values are concerned, it is therefore indeed certain that no ethical doctrine can be right, which neglects individuals and which disregards, I will not say their right, but their duty to centralize their lives and so their moral universe about their own purposes, right? So again, autonomy means acting for your own purposes and not letting someone else tell you what to do. But, um, but from Kant's point of view, Acting according to any desires or interests or purposes that I just find in myself can't count as autonomy. Yeah. Uh, do you have an opinion on why he says he wants to say a life but a duty? Um, uh, well, uh, so obviously he says that because, you know, He's so to speak, it's like saying um, the right. No, not the right, I mean the duty, right? So, uh, yeah. Um, um, right. Because in, in today's interpretation of language, it sounds kind of like dismissing, dismissing the right as like, a, like it doesn't quite have to do with that, but it's more like, it's more than a right, it's a duty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, so I mean, you you know, like we, we, we make that transitional, you know, like you might talk about the right to vote and then say, no, it's not a right, it's a duty <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, so unless you're a Pythagorean about beans. Um, all right, so anyway, um, right, what was I saying? Oh, so like these desires, whether they come from my natural self or they come from others, um, they're just things that happen to me according to thought. I don't give them to myself according to some principle. Um, and, you know, so what autonomy, uh, autonomy, Right, the auto part means self, but the nomi part means legislation. Autonomy means legislating for yourself. Um, and, you know, um, um, 
So like, according to Kant, if I'm going to legislate for myself, I need to give myself a lot, so to speak, before I know what desires I'm subjected to. That will tell me how to deal with those desires. I mean, that's why I said, like, really, this, you know, the categorical imperative doesn't really, um, it doesn't apply in the same way to a being that doesn't have its own desires. Yeah. You know, you, you have to have your own desires, but then the categorical imperative is going to limit them. You know, so, um, so, uh, but in order to limit them, it has to not be based on them. Right, this, this command that's going to, um, um, telling you how to balance all your desires against each other. Which you might think you could do by seeking happiness, but again, Royce and Kant agree that you, that won't work. So this command that's going to tell you how to balance all your desires against each other is like, uh, can't be based on your desires. So you, so to speak, know it before your desires, right? That's why Kant says it's a priori. Um, I mean, you don't literally, it's not like you literally, like sometime before you were born, you were sitting there thinking about the categorical imperative. <laughs> but, uh, but it's prior to whatever desires you find in yourself. Um, and, you know, that's why everyone will give themselves the same command. All the things that make them different from each other are, you know, have to be left out of account when they're making this decision. What, you know, is what makes what 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 is it that makes two people different from each other? Well, they, you know, they have different bodies. What does it mean that this is my body and this is not my body? Well, like if you prick this body, it doesn't hurt me. <laughs> So I don't have the same desire to avoid this body being pricked that I have to avoid this body being pricked, right? I find within my natural self a desire for no pins to be stuck into this body. And I at least don't find the same desire for no pins to be picked up, stuck into other bodies. I mean, there may be one also, right? You know, like sympathy or it's not, it's not the same thing, right? So, like, this is morally speaking why we're different, because we have different interests, we have different desires. Um, but since we're going to decide on this before, so to speak, before we know what those different desires are, the answer is, has got to come out the same for everyone. And again, Kant tries to use that to get the actual content. Of the, you know, he says, and there's only one type of command that everyone can could reach, you know, whatever. But that, you know, that, so the details of how Kant goes on with this is not important here because because Royce doesn't um, follow him. But um, but I think what's clear from this is that you know uh, um, First of all, that, that, as I said, that, that Royce doesn't seem to understand how Kant uses the term autonomy. Um, because he seems to connect it with, you know, as he put it, centering my moral world on my own purposes. But from Kant's point of view, autonomy is almost the opposite of that. It's disregarding my own purposes in order to legislate for myself. Right. So, um, but second of all, I think, you know, this highlights uh, that, that Royce's answer is not really complete yet. Um, because we've been told that uh, individuals can, like, freely unify their will by freely choosing a cause to which to devote themselves. And they choose it from among the causes 
that are made available by the social order. Um, and, you know, that, by the way, is why even at this stage, Royce has made a kind of political prescription, right? The social order ought to provide such causes. He's going to say in the time reading for next time that American society isn't doing well at that, <laughs> providing such causes. Um, but um, so the the universal principle is that I should raise myself out of mere individuality by choosing a particular cause. And once I've chosen a particular cause, that will determine my will. But how am I supposed to make that choice? I mean, the universal principle that I just cited doesn't seem to give me any guidance. It just says you have to choose a cause. Um, so it seems like um, I'm just going to be thrown back on my own chaotic whims. And so it seems like this choice is going to be autonomous in Royce's sense of autonomous, right? It's going to be like, yeah, I'm going to make it according to my own purposes, not according to what someone else tells me. Um, but it's not autonomous in the strict sense uh, that Kant gives it. It's not prescribed by universal law, right? There's no universal law that told me to choose this cause. Um, now, um, so, so Hegel, let me mention Hegel one more time. So, you know, Hegel looked for related reasons, at least, or partly for this reason, um, says, well, we, you know, we have to take a, a new look at the logical relation between universality, particularity, and individuality, right? So like Hegel reworks logic in order to, <laughs> to solve this problem and others that are um, supposed to be the same problem, basically. Um, but Royce, even though, as I was saying, he seems to be influenced in some way by Hegel, doesn't follow him on that, right? So you don't see any of these things like uh, being is nothing or universal is the particular, right? <laughs> that you would see in Hegel. Um, so, um, so what is he gonna say about this? Like, what will, what universal principle is going to step in and allow me to make this choice if it's not Kantian, not Kant's categorical imperative? And I think what, so whether what Royce has to say about this is satisfactory, I'm not sure, but what he does have to say about it will be, um, will be covered under what he's going to call loyalty to loyalty. And that's going to be like, that's going to be the universal principle. And that's going to be in the reading for next time. Um, so I just kind of like set up why he needs something like that. Um, he needs something like that to make this choice not only autonomous in his improper sense of autonomous, but something like autonomous in Kant's proper sense of autonomous that is made according to a universal principle. The universal principle is going to be loyalty to loyalty. So anyway, um, I'll, I'll talk about that next time. Um, are there, you know, I haven't stopped the question at any point here, although there, someone asked the question. Are there questions before I go on? Because I'm going to talk about something else. Okay. Um, oh, yes. 
Um, I just wanted to uh, go back a little bit when you're talking about um, how other people are a consequence of this. Like, why can't something that's bigger than myself be like taking care of an animal? Or oh, why does it have to be people? Um, I mean, so uh, like Royce doesn't discuss that possibility. Um, um, or even if I think of like survival as something that is a cause bigger than myself, and that's why I live, then I could just be an individual. Well, isn't like self, like survival, like being self sufficient, not contributing to a bigger cause bigger than me? It's just like, yeah, but if you think of like survival as like a thing of nature and you're a part of the system and then you like, oh, like, farm and like, so you think of like pool of like something that's bigger than yourself. Like, well, you mean not just your own survival, but survival of creatures in general, or you mean no, like, say, like, you're an individual, like, you're a caveman, or like, right. back before society, and you're like, okay, well, I don't really have a call here myself, so I don't really have any advantage of desires, but my desire is to survive right now, and it's like, I don't really know why, but it's bigger than myself, and I have no idea doing this. <laughs> But like it's also like I guess I would if you wanted to reproduce it with yeah. But then that includes like other people, but like before you I guess you have to have a family. Yeah, so you know the answer is I'm not sure. Uh um I mean so It, I mean, it is something larger than your your present desire, right? Because I mean, um, um, because sometimes uh, your present desire might not be not to survive, and then you're going to remind yourself. So actually, this this is actually what Socrates says. I mean, he says different things in different dialogues, but um, like when they, you know, when when he says that, uh, so I guess this is in the Phaedrus, when he's proving that um, that philosophy is preparation for death because the soul is in a better state after death, and whatever. And then they say, well, why why do you keep on living then? Why what doesn't that mean we should commit suicide? And he says, well, no, like I've been stationed here by the gods <laughs> and I'm not allowed to abandon my post, right? So that's like loyalty to your own survival, basically, uh, regarded as a cause bigger than yourself. Yeah. Um, I'm just like, uh, for like why your cause has to be involved with other people is a question. I, I mean, it just has to involve the idea of loyalty, or but then that wouldn't require like other people. Well, it, so it, I mean, so I was I I was making the contrast, and Royce makes the contrast between a cause that involves other people and a cause that's just an abstract principle. Um, so, but you're giving other examples that are neither, I think, right? Like either it involves other animals, but they're not people, which you know, so like in this context, we could say animals means that it is non-human animals means um, that uh, they don't will any principles, right? Like they don't. Uh, so, I mean, you know, whether that's true of particular, you know, like whether that's true of horses or parrots or chimpanzees or whatever, but like assume there are some living things that like, that. It, so like, let's say that like, they can't in the same sense be loyal to the to the cause that you're loyal to. But, is, but still they're external to you, isn't that enough? And then the other example you were giving is where the thing that's external to you is yourself, uh, 
I mean, you could say your, your future self, but I'm not sure that's the right way to look at it. But anyway, it's somehow the thing that's external to you, external to your desires is your own, you know, future survival. Uh, so like, yeah, I mean, those are good questions. I don't know. Uh, it would be hard for me to answer those questions on behalf of Royce because um, I don't know where to go to see what he thinks about our relationship to non-human animals, like or what life means, or how it's related to morality. Um, um, and on the other hand, it would be hard to answer for Hegel because he says way too much about it. <laughs> but, uh, so, but it's a good question. That's all I can say. I think you're first, yeah. Um, I just wanted to maybe take a shot at the why there's a lot of loyalty have to involve other things. Um, I think that commonly we define like just simply lengthening your own life or continuing to live as fulfilling a desire that you have. Or if it's not, then like oh, that is probably happening to you. That's no longer a desire. Um, so you wouldn't need to be loyal to the um, extension of your own life. Whereas some force outside of you can um, it's a it's it's something that is not connected to your own needs. Because if you're just loyal to yourself, you could have one disciplined way of acting and then decide to be wrong and change it. And so you wouldn't be consistent, you wouldn't be loyal to the same thing, but you'd still be loyal to yourself. you wouldn't be loyal to the same course of action, but you'd still be loyal to yourself. Whereas being loyal to something outside of you would more likely require that uh, you know a consistent course of action. Yeah, so, or I guess you could put it, and this might apply to both of the examples, but I'm still, yeah, that you could say, well, what's required is an independent will, right? So, and where if you understand will in a sufficiently strong sense, that means it has to be like a rational will, you know? So, And if, right, I mean, you could say the same thing I said about the abstract principle, like, and I think it's what you were just saying too, that like, um, if you say, well, that's not what I meant. This doesn't count as a case of survival. There's no one to call you to account. It was the whole thing was just established by your institution to begin with. So like you're empowered to reinterpret it, basically. Um, and the same thing might be true for the animals, right? Because you can't, um, I mean, and this does happen when people take care of animals, right? At some point they decide, well, uh, it's better for the animal not to suffer. Right, and we're going to put it to sleep. And, uh, or, um, or maybe that's not even the best example. Maybe it's the other, like, so, so we have two cats and they've been indoor cats their whole lives. They really want to go outside. <laughs> so, like, are, you know, are we being disloyal to them by not letting them go outside? Well, so, like, you want to ask them. Given everything we know about, you know, like how dangerous it is for cats to go outside, how bad it is for the ecosystem, they kill all the birds, you know, whatever. Like, given everything we know, cats, do you still want to go outside and then get their consent? But it's impossible, <laughs> you know. So we basically like make up for ourselves what loyalty to the cats means. Um, whereas, like if, uh, well, I guess he's not only gonna introduce this example next time, so maybe we'll talk about it, but you know, yeah. So, but anyway, like, yeah, if I say, um, you know, 
At this point, I think loyalty to the United States means like invading the Capitol building and threatening the senators. Um, and so like the society that I'm claiming to be loyal to is gonna decide one way or the other, <laughs> right? Like is, 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 is gonna say, well, I'm, you know, either, I hope this doesn't happen, but either it's going to say, yes, you're a hero, or <laughs> it's going to say, uh, um, no, I'm sorry, you weren't being loyal to us. You know, we have this, we're acting on the same information that you have, and no. <laughs> so, right, so the, yeah, like your own survival can't do that, and the other animals can't do that. I think that's basically what you were saying. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think it's kind of the same thing, like, like the, the whole point of giving yourself over to a cause, it seems like you, you don't have to be autonomous anymore. It's something that, that you can like give yourself over to and it determines things for you. And the only way that you can have a cause that does that is if there are other people that you know, that contribute to it. Um, you're just something like a cat or a dog wouldn't be able to do. Yeah, although I mean, I think that's what you what you said to begin with is a little bit wrong in terms of what Royce actually thinks. I mean, remember, I read that thing that where he said that autonomy and his sense of autonomy, that people should center their lives around their own purposes, that this is an important moral principle and no one should deny it. Um, right. So, like when he talks about the um, his example of the Japanese moral code of Bushido or you know he says like um this isn't something that the samurai could could be like could be part of without using their own initiative and right like it's it, it's not like um it turns them into machines or something mm -hmm. on the contrary they're constantly called upon to interpret the code of Bushido for themselves and you know Etc. So, um, and I think we'll see that more clearly with his example of uh, Speaker of the House of Commons in the next reading. Um, I, but so isn't it more like self interest that you should give your self interest over to something that's greater than you? You can only do that if it's something that other people are contributing to. Right. Like if it's something that can assert its interest. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, and assert it in the right way, right? Because the cats can insert their interests, right? They want to go up to the door and start meowing. But that doesn't really count because they because they don't know what the decision will make. Something like, I don't know exactly what the respect is, but um, so um, I mean, obviously that line of thought is dangerous. People often say that about other human beings too. They tell us that they want X, but they just don't, you know, they're not capable of making that decision. Um, I mean, like we say that about children. I guess this is a good question. If if I mean it's different because you expect them to become rational beings later. Like, can you be, according to Royce, can, be, can you be loyal to your children if they haven't reached the age of, like, the age of reason, whatever that is? Yeah. It kind of depends on how we determine whether or not someone can act in their own best interests. I really like the cat analogy because I, I live on the far west side, and any time of night, if I open my door, there's probably some coyotes around. And my cat would love to go outside and explore. But I know if it goes outside, we're not getting the cat back. <laughs> so if I have to act in the cat's best interest in more of it's survival and say, no, you're not going out there. And it's, yeah, so much of humans, how we can determine whether or not we can act on our own conditions. Yeah, and you can't, like, again, you can't say to the cat, look, the reason I'm not letting you know is because of the coyotes and the cat say, I'm willing to take that risk. My life inside is not worth it, right? Because it, it, it would be so bad for you. Well, but I, but I, I mean, I think at least, at least, well, we think this way about cats because if the problem, if the cat could do that, and we just don't speak cat, then, then like we should be learning to speak cat, right? I mean, we shouldn't be giving them right, <laughs> right? Like with, with, you know, with people who are adults and in their right minds, I mean, um, 
Well, it's complicated. We do sometimes coerce them in their own best interests, but uh, um, but it certainly, at least as an individual, you can't do that. Right? <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, you know, like if you had someone living in your house who uh, like only spoke French and you didn't know French. You couldn't like keep them locked up and say, "Well, I don't know French, <laughs> so I can't ask them." Right? You would have to. You would have to somehow learn French. <laughs> um, all right. Anyway, uh, um, so we at least think, whether rightly or wrongly, when we act that way with cats, we think that it's there is no such thing as cat. <laughs> right? Like they they're not speaking animals. Not log on F on F on case. <laughs> um, all right. Um, that are there more questions about that? Because I, I did want to go on to talk about a couple other things, but all right. Um because I wanted to talk a little bit more about um so a, a couple of the types of individualism, a couple of the other types of individualism that Royce responds to. So, I mean, first of all, there's the objection of the earnest young son of Russian immigrants. Now, <clears throat> this thing about immigrants is, you know, um, is important to Royce, and we'll see it's even more important to the next person we're reading, Jane Adams. Like, like somehow the um, the crisis of loyalty to America is is involved with somehow the fact that there's this huge new wave of immigration um, from uh, uh, Italy and Eastern Europe, places like that. You might think, considering that Royce is from California, that he would be talking about Asian immigration. But Royce actually wrote a history of California, which I read at some point. Um, but I don't remember, he talks a lot about, he's very critical of the US annexation of California. Um, he talks, he's, he like kind of idealizes the pre-American Mexican society in California and then describes how the American annexation was like totally illegal and whatever. Um, uh, I don't remember if he talks about the treatment of Asians there. And since he starts with the ideal state before the imperialists enter as the like the haciendas, he doesn't talk about the Native Americans. <laughs> but anyway, uh, um, so yeah, so somehow the fact that this earnest young man is the son of Russian immigrants, I think is supposed to be important. Um, maybe I'll come back to discussing this earnest young man later from that point of view. But from the point of view of the individualistic objection, Royce's answer is pretty sta straightforward, right? Like he said, well, you just, you've misunderstood what I mean by loyalty. You know, you think it means this kind of blind loyalty that the Russian peasants show. Uh, but no, I mean like the loyalty of a samurai. <laughs> Right. So, uh, um, and he says, when you understand that that's what I mean by loyalty, you'll see that you yourself are expressing loyalty to this objection. Right? You're, it's not individualistic in the sense that you're saying, well, I don't want to put up with this stuff, man. Right? You know, it's individualistic in the sense that you're saying, I'm loyal to the oppressed and I won't let you get them down with loyalty. Right? So, um, that's what he says about about that type of individualism. I'm like more interested in what he says about the bad, selfish type of individualism, and also the um, objection on behalf of spirituality. So, because why am I interested in this? 
um, I feel like somewhere between these is his objection to Emerson and or Thoreau, but I'm not sure which or whether he's read them correctly, therefore. I mean, remember Thoreau, um, already says in Walden, you know, but all this is very selfish, my, you know, my townsmen object. Um, and, uh, um, and then on the other hand, he has some version of what Royce is calling the objection from spirituality. So, right, so that, like, the selfish individualism, this is on page 66. Um, and this also involves a weird aside, which I'm not sure what to do with. The modern man, and then all of a sudden, for once, he realizes that man might mean man instead of woman, but in a kind of weird backhanded way, because he says, the modern man, yes, the modern woman also, as we sometimes are told, <laughs> can be content only with the completest possible self-development and the fullest self-expression which the conditions of our social life permit. Now, I mean, later he's gonna talk about the example of a woman deciding between, um, um, devoting herself to her profession. And I think the other alternative is taking care of her sick parent or something like that. Um, and he like um, basically says only she can decide. That's, you know, that's how he answers that case. She's gonna have to decide. Um, so, well, I mean, obviously, like, it's specifically a woman in that case, <laughs> I think, right? But on the other hand, the answer is it's up to her to decide. Um, so the, the tone here, where it's like weirder to be told that a woman should reach the completest possible self-development is um, it's not as complete view. <laughs> I I think it's but it I think it is he does feel like the assertion of this bad selfish type of individualism is particularly jarring in that case. All right, I don't know. I I mean I just I don't know exactly what to say about that. More I just felt like I couldn't go past that remark without saying something about it. The main point here is what these people are saying, which is the highest good for everyone is self-development. Um, so, uh, and um, um, the people who think this, he says, they, you know, they believe that everyone has a right, the right to this per like most perfect self-development. And he says, they, they say, oh yeah, maybe we have duties too, but that's kind of abnormal and annoying. <laughs> For the most part, what we have is a right to self-development. Um, um, and his response to it is, the selfish we had always with us, but the divine right to be selfish was never more ingeniously defended in the name of the loftiest spiritual dignity than it is sometimes defended and illustrated today. So that does sound like it could be an objection to Thoreau. Um, I would say more about it, but there's only two minutes left. <laughs> so I'm gonna try to say something about the one about spirituality. Um, good works for other men and what externally appears as loyal conduct. Such things may and will result from the attainment of inner perfection but will so result merely because the good soul overflows, just as, to adapt the famous metaphor of Plotinus, just as the sun shines, 
So this one sounds almost like an allusion to Thoreau. And also like saying, oh, Thoreau, you just lifted your metaphor from Plotinus. <laughs> okay. um, um, but Rousseau, I mean, sorry, Rousseau, Royce's answer to that is um, that the kind of speech, uh, sign of peace or like spiritual contentment that you want is not the kind that consists in falling asleep. <laughs> so you still are need to, need, gonna need something to tell you what to do um, with your inner peace. And that's gonna be loyalty. All right, like I said, I, there's a lot more to say about this, but it's time to go. So I will see you Thursday.